I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of the main locations in Game of Thrones aren't cities. There's a bunch of castles, open fields, and roads, but very few cities. A lot of the big cities are in Essos, where the majority of Daenerys' story takes place. But in Westeros, there are only five major cities. The one that I'm sure comes to mind is King's Landing. Considering how large and developed this place is, it was surprising to read how much older the lesser four seen cities are. All five are fairly well distributed throughout the Seven Kingdoms. The lands beyond the wall are just a cold wasteland, still way too primitive to even form a town, so the five cities are focused around the lower half of the continent. They've all grown to be rich and powerful because of their ports, and advantageous positioning that easily allows for trade. The oldest and formerly largest city before King's Landing is Old Town, which is located in the Reach. This place is so old that it predates any written history. It's believed to have started as a trading post in the Dawn Age, which is a time period around 10,000 years before the start of the story. So yeah, Old Town is old, and has that name for a reason. Some exotic goods from the Summer Isles or even Valyria were likely traded here. Old Town is one of the few locations in the world where a mysterious and ancient oily material called Blackstone can be found. House Hightower, who rules over the city and have since the Dawn Age, made their home within a large block of black stone and made it their fortress. There are many small islands within Old Town because of the Honeywine River that gives access to the city, and the Blackstone Fortress is on one of these small islands called Battle Isle. To better defend their home, the Hightowers built walls around the black stone and a tower atop of it. After making the towers out of wood didn't work, Ulthor of the Hightower hired Bran the Builder to make one out of stone, and it continues to stand tall to this day. They simply called their home the High Tower, and it's also used as a lighthouse. A famous legend in this kingdom is that the first man to ever cross over to Westeros from Essos was a mythical king named Garth Greenhand, who taught men how to farm. The houses from all over the Reach claimed descent from him, and it was his daughter, Maris the Maid, who married Uther of the High Tower. Her beauty inspired the first ever tourney in Westeros to fight for her hand in marriage. While fifty lords were fighting it out for her, she married Uther of the High Tower, who didn't even participate. House Hightower was likely founded long before these two, however. There's much more to this city aside from the Hightower. Uthor of the Hightower and Maris the Maid's two sons are responsible for the creation of the Citadel. The younger brother was bedridden most of his life, so spent his time obsessing over knowledge. He had experts of all fields come to Old Town to answer the world's questions. He would live a short life, but his older brother had the Citadel built to continue their search for answers, in his honor. It became a place for people to study and become maesters for all of Westeros. The towers and domes of the citadel are all connected with stone bridges that have houses all along it. The oldest building of the citadel is the Ravenry on the Isle of Ravens. The Isle of Ravens was once the stronghold of a pirate lord. Also in Old Town is a Starry Sept. This was like the Faith of the Seven's headquarters before it relocated to Baylor Sept in King's Landing thousands of years later. As the city grew, it became a labyrinth of alleys, streets, and markets. Everything in Old Town is built in stone. The streets are cobbled, the bridges are stone, and so are the high walls that protect its people. It's still the richest city in the Seven Kingdoms, even though King's Landing trumps their population. It's also more beautiful and doesn't have the same stench. When you think of wealth, you usually think of the Lannisters, since they are the richest family. But their riches come from the mine that they made their home, and that stays within the family. Their castle and gold mine, Castle Rock, overlooks the third largest city called Lannisport. It's located in the Westerlands, and is ruled by a branch family of the Lannisters called House Lannister of Lannisport. The family must have overgrown Castle Rock, or simply wished to expand. They didn't travel far, since Lannisport is only a mile from the castle. The natural harbor had walls built around it for protection, and they really needed it. The western coast of the Seven Kingdoms is constantly plagued with attacks from the Ironborn. The Lannisters' entire fleet is located at the Lannisport Harbor, outside the city's walls, and the burning of their entire fleet is what initiated the Greyjoy Rebellion a few years before the start of the series. Euron Greyjoy planned a surprise attack. The Lannisters would eventually get their revenge because it was a dumb rebellion that had no chance of success. The witch that Cersei had her fortune read by lived and operated her creepy business in Lannisport. She was called Maggie the Frog and was pretty popular in the city for her love potions and cures. Heading towards the northeastern part of the map is the fourth largest city. The only city in the Vale is Gulltown. It's a wealthy port city ruled by House Grafton, which is surprising since there is a branch family of House Aaron living here called House Aaron of Gulltown. Even though they are wealthy merchants, they are looked down upon by the main branch and avoid talking about them. Not a lot is written about House Grafton, but they did come during the Andal invasion 6,000 years ago, along with the Aarons. The Vale was actually the first stop when the Andals sailed here from Essos. 
Gold Town was already an operating port led by the First Men family, House Shet. But since the Aarons and the rest of the Andals took the veil, House Shet, which is still around today, lost control of the city. The people here don't have the protection of the Mountains of the Moon like a lot of the other areas of the Vale. But since all the trade from ships coming in and out of here, they could afford to have stone walls built to protect them. Because of his close ties with Lysa Tully, Peter was given the position of control of customs at Gulltown. He was bringing more money in and performing so well that John Aaron, who was handed the king, brought him to King's Landing where he became master of coin. Gulltown, like Lannis Port and the fifth largest city, have made an appearance in Game of Thrones. And the fifth largest city up in the north is White Harbor. You would think Gulltown and King's Landing would get all the trade between the narrow sea, and if you did think that, you would be right. It's not the exotic goods that made this place thrive, but it was the fact that White Harbor is the connection between the north and the southern kingdoms. Even though they are a popular seafood stop, merchants come here to trade knowing it will be distributed throughout the north, which is the largest kingdom in size. While you can enter White Harbor through the sea, a river called the White Knife can take you further north, up to Winterfell and beyond. They may be the smallest of all the major cities, but White Harbor has made House Manderley the richest family in the north. But this location's history begins before this family. Long before the start of the series, King John Stark had a castle built by the White Knife. This castle was named Wolfsden, and its purpose was to defend against raiders. The small islands off the coast of the north is the Three Sisters. Since these islands are in between the north and the Vale, many wars have been fought over ownership of the land. The locals had a history of pirating and raiding, which explains the reasoning for Wolf's Den. The people of the Three Sisters now resent Northerners for the past wars and aren't even very loyal to the Aarons, who they swear fealty to. Many houses made Wolf's Den their home, one of them being the Grey Starks, who are a branch family of the Starks. Eventually, it would land in the hands of House Manderley. The Manderleys were exiled from the Reach, and the Starks gave them this new home in return for defending the White Knife for the kingdom and loyalty. Even in the current story, Lord Wyman Manderley has fierce loyalty for the Starks and is a fan favorite for readers. They came to the north with enough wealth to build White Harbor and even a new castle, which funny enough is simply called Newcastle. This port city grew to the point of being considered one of five major cities in Westeros. Wolf's Den has since been turned into a prison. The Manderleys are a powerful enough principal house of the Starks that houses in this area like House Lock of Old Castle and Ramsgate owe allegiance to them and take their lead. Because of their origins in the Reach, the Mandalees continue their old traditions like following the Faith of the Seven and Knighthood, so they truly serve as a bridge between the North and the South. The largest sea and the capital of the Seven Kingdoms only came into existence 300 years before the start of the series. After a little over 100 years of Targaryens just chilling at Dragonstone with their dragons, Aegon would get ambitious and want more for himself and his family. After a disagreement with the Storm King, Aegon decided to conquer all the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros and unite the continent for the first time. With his two sister wives and their dragons, they landed with a small army at the mouth of the Black Water, where three large hills stood. The largest hill would be named Aegon's High Hill, Visenya's Hill, and the Hill of Rainies would be named after his sister wives. The base during their conquest was built atop of Aegon's High Hill. It was called Aegon Fort. Atop the two other hills, Seps would be built. It wouldn't make much sense to rule over the entire continent isolated on the island Dragonstone, and Aegon Fort was just a base during the war, so Aegon decided to tear it down and build a new castle on its hill. It only took 25 years for King's Landing to surpass White Harbor and Gulltown. What started as a region for fishermen would become the capital of the Seven Kingdoms, with the largest population. While the Red Keep was being built, Aegon returned to live on Dragonstone. An entire city was growing around this location. It would be appropriately named King's Landing. Aegon would not be alive long enough to see the completion of the Red Keep, however. His second son, Megor the Cruel, oversaw the completion of it. Megor wanted a bunch of secret passages within the castle in case of an attack. Without knowing these tunnels very well, it could get dangerous because of all the traps laid out. When the castle was complete, Megor had all the builders killed so the secrets of the castle wouldn't get out. In the current story, the former spymaster Varys is one of the few characters who know these passages well enough to make use of them. Also within the Red Keep are the dungeons. It has four levels for the different types of prisoners held. The highest level has your average criminal within the average type of cells that you see everywhere. The second level is reserved for highborn prisoners. The cells here are a lot more comfortable and they are kept alone instead of being locked away with a group of prisoners. The worst criminals are kept in the third level called the black cells. Like the name suggests, there is no light here. The fourth and last level is where prisoners are tortured for information or for whatever reason the king orders. Megor's cruelty continued throughout his reign. The Faith of the Seven opposes rule, 
and in return he had the sept that was on the hill of Rainies burned down atop his dragon. He had a dome built to replace it where it would house all the family's dragons. This place was called the Dragon Pit. It wasn't easy for Minigor to find builders to construct a dragon pit after what he did to the people who built the Red Keep. He had to get prisoners to do all the manual labor. The dragon pit didn't last very long however since it would be left in ruins after the Targaryens had their civil war within the family. Many years later, King Baylor Targaryen, nicknamed the Blessed, had a vision of a great sept. He orders construction of Top Visenya's Hill, and it wouldn't be completed until after his death. It was named the Great Sept of Baylor after him. This sept became the Faith's headquarters. We see this place blow up from wildfire in the season 6 finale of Game of Thrones. At the bottom of Visenya's Hill in King's Landing is a guild hall of alchemists. This is where an organization of pyromancers do all their magic. They are nowhere near as powerful as they once were. Now all they do is produce a substance of wildfire. When the Mad King planned to destroy King's Landing in case the city fell to Robert's rebellion, he had the guild prepare a large amount of wildfire. Jaime Lannister prevented the Mad King from blowing the city up by killing him in the Great Hall. This is the King's throne room in the Red Keep, where the Iron Throne sits. This throne was made from the swords of men who surrendered to Aegon the Conqueror. After the Targaryens, Robert took the Iron Throne for himself, and the city now is under House Baratheon of King's Landing. Flea Bottom is an area where the poorest small folk in the city all live. This place is known for its horrible smell and a certain dish they feed the poor. It's called a bowl of brown and its description is pretty disgusting. The large tubs where it's made continuously cooks it for years, with people believing it to have rat meat and dead bodies. There's a few fan favorite characters that come from these alleys. Sir Davos Seaworth, Gendry, and Sir Duncan the Tall are all from here. Merchants came swarming to be a part of the city, and now entire streets are dedicated to a specific service, like the Street of Silk, the Street of Steel, or the Street of Flower. The city is roughly shaped like a square and is walled in for protection. There are seven gates that lead out of the city into various roads, which lead into other kingdoms. The large population within the walls are protected by the city watch, who are called the Gold Cloaks. While this place is massive in Westeros, to some of the ancient and powerful cities across the narrow sea in Essos. This makes a lot of sense considering there aren't many kingdoms in Essos. It's mostly self-ruling cities like Karth or the Free Cities and Slaver Cities. I talk about all these places in my map detailing series, and I only decided to make this video because people were requesting a separate, more focused video on Old Town and King's Landing, so I hope this format worked out. Thanks for watching guys.